Uh, so we're happy to offer this opportunity for those interested in computing and sustainability. The virtual seminar series is organized by CompSusNet with support from the National Science Foundation and Cornell University. My name is Doug Fisher. I'm having trouble with my video today, so you won't see me. Uh, and I'm director of the uh, of Outreach, uh, Education, Diversity, and Synthesis of CompSusNet. I and other members of the outreach team, which includes uh, Professor uh, Carla Gomes, Christiane White, and Rich Bernstein, schedule talks on computational sustainability regularly uh, and post them at the URL on this slide. You can see previous talks there where many are recorded and posted. Uh, and we'll be recording uh, talks in the future and posting them. In two weeks, we'll have Professor Paul Fackler of North Carolina State University, who will be speaking on dynamic programming applied to natural resource management. During the webinar, you can ask questions through the question and answer facility on Zoom, uh, which will be related to the speaker as time allows. Um, Professor Leighton Brown has indicated not just a willingness, but um, enthusiasm about uh, an interactive uh, session. So don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, we may wait until the end of the presentation in some cases. Uh, but if you have questions that you want to ask during the presentation, um, make it clear in your uh, post. And if you want to, we'll elevate you to be a panelist so you can ask the question directly. Otherwise, we'll ask it. Um, if you want to, anyone who wants to, go to the chat window now and say hi to all attendees so you know where to find it. Um, we have Comp CompSusNet has several social media outlets too, including Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the CompSus blog, which you can also find links to on the uh, website. But I'm going to go ahead and say a few words about him, a longer introduction perhaps than um, usual, but he's a professor at, uh, of computer science at the University of British Columbia, and he holds a PhD from Stanford University. He's co-written two books, Multi-Agent Systems and Essentials of Game Theory, and over 100 peer referee technical articles. Uh, his, he and his scholarship and his teaching have received numerous awards, and he has co-taught game theory to over a million students on Coursera. Uh, so we are indeed excited to hear from him today. Okay. Well, today, thanks for bearing with us. Um, I'll be telling you about Kudu, which is a project that I've been involved in in uh, Uganda to build a mobile market for agricultural trade. And uh, I guess maybe you've already heard a little bit about that in the introduction. I'm not sure what you've heard, but, uh, but let's dive in. So um, the first thing I want to tell you about is that there's a really big group of people who have been involved in uh, making Kudu a reality. Um, here's uh, the kind of core collaborator team. Uh, we have uh, a big group at McCarray University. And indeed, this project began when I was on sabbatical at McCarray University. So um, John Quinn uh, was a professor there. Now he works for the United Nations. Um, Richard Tachibule is a, a former PhD student there. Now he's gotten his PhD, still working on Kudu. Um, Neil Newman is a PhD student of mine at UBC. Um, Craig McIntosh is uh, a, 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 a developmental econ economist at uh, UC San Diego. And uh, Lauren Berquist is a, a former uh, student co-supervised by him from Berkeley, now herself a professor in Chicago. And I also have a, a couple of colleagues from Microsoft Research uh, in New England, I'm Nicola Merlika and Brendan Lucier, who are involved in the project as well. So. Uh, really a, a big team of uh, different people involved. And in fact, it doesn't even stop there. So we also have uh, a bunch of different partners in Uganda uh, helping to deliver the system. So Agrinet is a, a private agribusiness um, market company that, that we're partnering with in Uganda. Um, ITA is a kind of um, grant management company that helps to uh, make big projects a reality in Uganda. Um, and then, um, Together with, with those two organizations, we have uh, a team of, on the left, you can see our uh, deal coordinators who are uh, people who go out and actually you know, meet with uh, different kind of clients out in the villages, help try to train them in the system, help um, you know, build a network of people across the country who uh, can work with us. And we also have a call center that people can call into, which you can see on the right here. Uh, so we have all of these uh, team members as well um, working on Kudu. 
So um, let's dive in. Um, <laughs> hopefully you can see more of this than I can. Um, so uh, let, let me first of all tell you about the problem that we're trying to solve. So subsistence agriculture is a really big deal in Uganda. Um, something like 80% of the population um, works in agriculture. And so um, in, it's to a first order approximation, if you want to make lives better in Uganda, you want to make lives better for farmers. And um, when I went to Uganda, we looked at all kinds of different projects that we could uh, maybe get involved in. Uh, we, you know, we thought about problems to do with drug delivery. We thought about um, electoral reform. We thought about improving policing to make people's lives safer uh, and kind of on and on. Um, and this somehow was the project that really caught on and that uh, you know, has persisted to this day seven years later. But uh, so, so let me tell you kind of about the, the genesis of, of how I became aware of this problem. Um, it, it, uh, it really turns out that buyers and sellers in Uganda have a kind of a ridiculously hard time just finding each other. Um, and you know, anyone who has spent time uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, will be aware that um, you know, infrastructure is just not what it is in the West. And so um, you know, getting around in rural areas is really non-trivial. Uh, you know, roads are um, pretty choppy. Um, you know, there can be really terrible traffic. Sometimes there can be actual, you know, risk driving around, uh, for example, being robbed or having money extorted by the police. So just even getting around is hard. People aren't necessarily that willing to, um, to go exploring. And, uh, and furthermore, there's just really bad information about what's out there. Um, so what often happens is farmers will just actually like get a bunch of produce and wait by the side of the road, hoping that somebody will come along and buy their stuff. Conversely, in the cities, uh, sometimes you just can't find what you want. So, you know, I would go down to the place uh, where I would uh, buy my food, which was just kind of, you know, the side of the road. There'd be people who'd lay out blankets by the side of the road, and they'd, um, you know, put out, you know, cucumbers and tomatoes and, you know, whatever it is that I would want to buy. And and some days I would go there, and there would just be no tomatoes. And there was no particularly good reason for that because um, Uganda is a, a equatorial country with the uh, you know, tons and tons of farmers who are all growing tomatoes and, and people are very interested in selling their produce, but, but somehow, you know, it just didn't match up. Um, so we started speaking more broadly to people to try to find out whether this was indeed a kind of persistent problem or whether this just seemed uh, to us to be a problem. And um, we found that, you know, indeed, um, there, there are really robust arbitrage opportunities um, offered, uh, if you just kind of look at price data, that, that indicates that something is really going wrong with the market. So um, what you can see in this graph here is um, prices for three different um, standard agricultural commodities in Uganda. Um, matoke is um, plantains. It's uh, kind of you know, bananas uh, that aren't very sweet and that are they used kind of as a starch, like potatoes. Um, maize, uh, which is corn and beans. So these are maybe you know, three of the main staple foods in Uganda. And for each of them, we thought about both um, temporal and spatial arbitrage. So by temporal arbitrage, we mean if I was to buy some food at prevailing prices in one part of the country, uh, you know, according to historical price data that we got access to, and then I was to rent a truck and pay a driver and pay the fuel cost and transport it over to some other part of the country, then, and then sell it at the prevailing prices in that place, um, would I be able to consistently make money? And uh, spatial, uh, so that's spatial arbitrage. Um, temporal arbitrage says, uh, if I was to, to buy some food at prevailing prices and rent a warehouse and pay for a security guard and pay for pest treatment and you know, pay rent, and then some number of months later, um, sell it at prevailing prices um, and also pay the cost of capital, um, would I again make money? Uh, and what, what the graph is showing, uh, I think in this case for temporal arbitrage, is that th there were really consistent opportunities to make money. Uh, you wouldn't like absolutely always make money regardless of you know, how long you, you held the crop. But you know, for example, if you were to buy crops during the growing season and then sell them kind of off cycle, um, there were pretty consistent ways of making money. Um, now, we didn't do this because we wanted to start a Ugandan hedge fund that would uh, you know, in fact do this. But, but we, we wanted to investigate this because from an economics point of view, this is really a signal that something is going wrong in the market. An efficient market um, wouldn't have the property that, um, that people were, 
you know, able to make giant amounts of money buying something in the market and then reselling it at another time or in another place. Um, it, the only way that can happen is, is you know, for there to be really substantial inefficiency in the market. Um, another way of thinking about this is that if, um, it, if these kinds of opportunities existed in um, more stable markets like our own, um, you would imagine that um, some third party would, you know, in fact, do this thing. They, they'd buy the, the crop and hold on to it for a while and then sell it and so on. And that would arbitrage away um, these price differences. And then you would end up once again with, with pretty consistent prices. So, so this shows that you know, somehow uh, the market's really not working. Uh, and that, that encouraged us to think that we, we maybe could uh, help make things better. Um, let, let me pause for a second. I, I see some of you talking to each other. And I want to make sure that I'm actually making noise. Uh, are, you, are you guys, in fact, able to hear me? I'm, I'm really doing something here. Okay. Uh, I, I, nothing would make me sadder than if I was standing here alone in my living room talking about Kudu to myself. No, we hear you well. Okay. So, so here, then, is the kind of story of Kudu. Here's, here's what we, um, we aim to do. We want to take farmers who live out in the villages and link them up with markets in the cities. So, so I should say all of the pictures in this slideshow, I didn't get them off Google Images. These are, are pictures we, we took ourselves uh, in the project. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you can see the, the guy out in the village. This is, uh, you know, in fact, what, what kind of farming in Uganda looks like. He's got a um, you know, standard farming implement. People are not working with uh, um, you know, big combines in Uganda, but, but nevertheless, he's got a mobile phone in his hand and you know, mobile phone penetration is ridiculous in Uganda. That people have phones everywhere. The phone service is really good. Um, it's it's really cheap. You can pay by the second. Um, it, it's kind of hilarious. People in Uganda will phone you um, and they'll say something and then they'll just hang up because it's it's almost like a text message by voice. Uh, they just pay by the second and the caller pays. So if they want to tell you something. They'll just tell you and then they'll just go away. And if you want to respond, you have to phone them back because then then you're paying. And at that point, they don't care. You can you can stay on the phone as long as you want. Um, so and and likewise, text messages are really cheap. They're like two cents a text message. Everything is prepaid. Um, so so phone phone service, you know, even for um, you know people of pretty limited means, uh, is is really you know a reality. People, people more like dramatically more people have phones than have access to electricity. Um, but the phones they have are not the phones you have. Uh, the phones they have is, are the phones that you know Carla first had when she got a phone, and that I had when I first got a phone, and that uh, those of you who are students, you know, there's read a question the, here. The blog or something. Um, they're they're really old school phones. They um, they, they basically only support text messaging. You know, they just have number keys, and you press repeatedly to get a letter. Um, you know, they're not smartphones, and they they can't browse the internet. Kevin, there's um, a question. The uh, situation in the cities is a lot better. Uh, the markets there are um, much more sophisticated. You can see this guy is a maize trader, has this big warehouse full of maize. He's got, uh, you know, he can walk down the street and talk to other people who also buy and sell maize. He, he understands the market pretty well. Uh, he's obviously not a, uh, an end customer of maize. He, he sells on maize to you know, companies that, uh, you know, institutional kitchens in a hospital and so on. But but he's uh, but grocery stores. But, but he he hear us? Market. So hey, our sense is not that the uh, the marketplace in the city needs Kevin. to be disrupted, uh, but rather that this <laughs> farmer out in the village uh, really needs a more reliable way of finding this guy. And, hey, uh, and indeed, these markets are really different. <laughs> Um, on the left, you can see um, pictures of, of what agriculture looks like in rural areas. So the, uh, the, the top left, what you're looking at is um, a, a typical kind of agricultural market where you can actually go to buy and sell crops uh, in a, a relatively rural area. And in the, the bottom left, uh, you can see uh, the warehouse of uh, a village where a bunch of different farmers um, gather their maize together um, they, they grind it up using a machine that the village collectively owns, and then they sell these sacks of, of milled maize, um, sometimes transporting it with the bicycle you see in the, in the back of this warehouse. And this is, this is in a village in a fairly remote place. Uh, on the other hand, on the right-hand side, uh, you see a, a market in Kampala uh, where every morning uh, these trucks overloaded with different agricultural commodities. And here you're looking at, uh, at Matoke, this uh, plantain I was telling you about. Um, they, they all kind of descend here at like six o'clock in the morning 
uh, and everyone you know, buys whatever they can get and uh, you know, disperses it throughout the city and to sell it in local markets and so on. Um, so you know, very different um, scales, very different levels of efficiency. Um, oh, and I guess when I paused before, what I had meant to say, but forgot, um, maybe um, Warren has said this to you already, um, is uh, I really want to uh, encourage all of you to uh, um, interrupt me just at, at any point that you have anything to say. I think it's much more interesting for all of us if you just interrupt. And I, I see Carla <laughs> waving with enthusiasm. I don't know if that means that she has something to say. Well, um, we have been trying. Yeah. Can you hear us? I don't hear anything. Can you hear me? Are we at a point where I should so be you better have a good question. No. <laughs> Kevin, can you hear us now? Okay, seriously. Yeah, we've been trying to uh, talk to you. Let's see. Kevin was coming through okay. just fine with me. Yeah, I, I, I see you now. Very oh, yeah. heads. I really seem to have a, a difficult time with my audio. Um, was, guys, I... I Everything was coming through fine here. No, we could hear him. He we can hear, hear him, but he can't he hear us. I see. But yeah, but he cannot hear us. I can type your question. <laughs> I, I was just curious. So, okay. So, 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 so I, I can hear you. Infrastructure for the telecommunication is very good. That's what. Am I, yeah. I was just am I still making noise? I think I am. Okay. Let's do it like this. Um, <laughs> was somebody trying to say something? Yeah, go ahead now. Can, can you hear me now? I can. Um, yeah, okay. this, this is okay, a perfect. technical nightmare, but uh, I think we've got it working. So please okay. go ahead. So, okay, so I, I was just a little bit curious. You said the road infrastructure is very bad, but it seemed like the telecommunication infrastructure is pretty good and the people are using cell phones a lot. I was just curious why there's such a big like discrepancy because my guess would be the government is like responsible for both of them. No, I mean, I think that's exactly it. Um, the telecommunications infrastructure is uh, the result of private corporations, and the road infrastructure is the result of the government. And, uh, corruption is a really huge problem. Um, you know, we were, we were shown, I was living in Uganda, a friend who was kind of a democracy activist, and she showed me how um, you know, road contractors, um, the government, would, you know, give a, a kickback and then they would they would lay a very thin level of asphalt rather than the appropriately thick amount of asphalt you're supposed to, and then it would just wash away in the first rain. Um, I mean, this is a story she told me. Um, I think the other thing is, frankly, it's, it's much, much easier to, um, to deploy, you know, a few cell phone towers here and there than it is to have good roads everywhere. Um, and, and you can monetize cell phones. I mean, the, the cell phone companies in Uganda are, um, you know, very competitive profit-making entities, whereas, you know, roads are paid for by taxes and, you know, corruption and poverty are kind of endemic everywhere. So, you know, you get in government and have a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, I think these are, these are just really uh, different, different things. But, but the, the amazing thing about telecommunications uh, in Uganda specifically, and from what I understand in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, is it's just kind of one institution Society that works ridiculously well, um, mostly because it, it, it kind of leapfrogged in, so there isn't a, a, a previous um, you know, widely dispersed telecommunications um, base that it, it disrupted. It's really kind of the first phones people have had. Uh, I think partly because um, you only have to put up towers here and there. You don't actually have to run wire all over the country. Um, but, but yeah, it actually uh, it, it really does work surprisingly well. Um, thanks for the question. Thanks. Uh, while we're pausing, while I can hear you, is there anybody else who uh, has something they'd like to ask? If, if I could just make one point, what I love about this slide, uh, everybody knows that w when I participate in these things, I keep asking, what's the decision? And this slide is great. I see nice decisions, bids, prices. And by the way, that ad on the back of the guy's t-shirt is another instance of the decision to do that is is uh, is actually a lot of fun to model. Hmm. So if we're looking for analytics challenges, this slide has a lot of good ones. We have a lot of analytics challenges, I have to say. We we uh, a, a theme that will emerge throughout my talk is that we've just been barely keeping our heads above water in terms of trying to make this thing grow, trying to make it 
you know, scale, trying to, to make it just kind of not fall apart in the middle of a growing season. Um, so, you know, we, do, we don't have uh, as much data as we would like because we don't have as many people using the system as we would like. We do have kind of a lot of data and we're, we're just starting to try to, you know, understand what it's telling us. But, uh, and of course, to clean it up and, and make it um, as consistent as we would like. But, but yeah, I think that there's a lot of scope for, for thinking about analytics. So, so I guess you guys have been uh, you're reading the slide while we've been talking, but, but let me walk you through it. So, um, you know, in the end, you know I'm telling you about Kudu, uh, which indeed you can, uh, you can see on, uh, on this gentleman's shirt here. Um, so, so what is the idea of Kudu? I, I like to kind of think of it as uh, Craigslist meets the Chicago Mercantile Exchange running over SMS. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, it's Craigslist in the sense that it's individual random people selling whatever it is they have. Uh, it's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the sense that it sells commodities rather than selling, you know, babysitting and sofas. Um, what's a commodity? It's, it's a thing where you don't care who you buy it from um, as long as you, you know kind of what it is you're getting. So um, if I get, you know, one share of IBM stock, I don't care whether I got it uh, from Carla or from Douglas. Um, and if I get one kilogram of maize, I don't care, you know, whether I got it in this village or that village. A kilogram of maize is a kilogram of maize, you know, at least up to grades of quality. Um, so th there's a, something great about commodities markets, which is that um, many goods are substitutes to each other. And those of you who know some economic theory know that having a lot of substitutes in a market is a really wonderful thing. It means uh, that there's more competition because there are more um, sellers who um, you know, look the same as each other, and there are more buyers who are looking for the same thing as each other, and that, that competition makes a market work better. Um, now, the, the really tricky thing about Kudu is that everything can't run on a web page because our customers can't see a web page. Um, you know, we need to make everything work either by people phoning each other or by sending SMS messages uh, to mobile phones. And uh, that's, that's really the design constraint. Um, if you were to run something like Craig, Craigslist for crops, you might just make it look a lot like Craigslist. You might just have, um, you know, people just post, you know, here's, you know, I've got uh, 13 uh, tons of maize and you know, I live in Mbale and, you know, here's my address and you know, come, come get my maize if you want it. Uh, th that would be kind of annoying because you would have to dig through a lot of relatively similar um, and post to find what, whatever you were looking for, but, but it would be workable. Uh, and indeed, um, Google tried to uh, put a system in place called Google Trader in Uganda that, that looked very much like that. Um, other um, NGOs over time have, have tried to do variations on the same thing. And th it, it really doesn't work that well uh, because people just kind of can't browse. You know, if you've got a phone that can display 80 characters at a time, um, you just can't look through web pages. And if you're paying, two cents a screen full of information, and it's too costly to you to browse as well. So um, this, is, this is kind of a fundamental problem. So instead, what we really need a market to do is to do this sort of backend matching where it decides um, you know, this um, buyer and this seller make sense to match together. Let's make them aware of each other's existence without making them dig through all of the alternatives. And that's really the core idea of Kudu. So, when I make a bid in Kudu, um, or, or, or rather when, when I'm, I'm thinking about whether I'm matching a bid um, with another bid makes sense, I, I wanna think about um, the price that, that was offered by my counterparty, uh, their reputation in the system, you know, whether, whether they you know, have traded before and whether people have been happy with them, the quality of the good on offer and, and the geographic location. Um, geographic location in particular is really important um, based on you know, what we were saying before about the, the roads being uh, uh, so difficult to navigate in some places, although not everywhere. Um, so at the moment, um, the, so Kudu kind of has two different uh, regimes. One is manual matching by call center employees. And uh, that, that's where you know, people really just kind of look at the web page you know, as though it was Craigslist, try to find something that they think makes sense, phone people up and say, you know, how would you feel about doing this trade? Eventually they get both of them on the phone, they, you know, they eventually make the trade happen. Um, that, uh, th that kind of hand-holding, um, you know, gold medal style treatment is, is worth doing at the very early days of a market because making a market start from nothing is a really tricky thing. If I'm a buyer 
I want to be in a market that has a lot of sellers. And if I'm a seller, I want to be in a market that has a lot of buyers. And so for each side of the market, it doesn't make a lot of sense to join a market that's really small. And our challenge um, starting out and, and you know, even at the scale we're at now is really just having the market be thick enough, having there be enough activity uh, from counterparties that, that any given person would want to come and join the market. And, and having this kind of uh, personalized attention is one way of overcoming that obstacle. Ultimately, we want Kudu to function entirely or almost entirely using automatic matching, where we would just decide, you know, this person and this person ought to be matched together. We're going to send you text messages telling you that uh, that you should trade, and you guys should sort of figure it out. Um, and you know, indeed, the system is built to do that, and some fraction of our trades happen that way. Um, we also send out price alerts uh, via uh, SMS messages. Um, this is really important. At, it wasn't our intention, but it looks at the moment as though um, Kudu's um, biggest impact on people's lives right now is through giving them accurate price information by SMS. Uh, and that means whether they're trading you know, on our platform or they're just trading uh, with a person they already know, uh, farmers who live in remote areas can, can be really empowered by knowing more about um, how much um, the market will bear for their crops at a given moment. Um, you know, it, it turns out these prices really fluctuate dramatically over time, and uh, farmers have a hard time getting unbiased information. You know, it's like if you go to a real estate agent and you say, is, is right now a good time to buy a house? Um, you can be pretty assured they're always going to say yes, <laughs> you know, and, and you can be pretty sure that if you, you know, ask them, you know, what's the, the lowest price I can get for this house, you know, you're not going to get a really excellent information from them because they have a stake in the outcome and they make more money the, the higher a price you pay. And you know they're more interested in the trade than you getting a good deal. So you know, it's hard to find a, a party you can talk to in a market that will give you unbiased information about what prices are. Uh, and and really the the only reliable way of doing that is to watch trades happen and to tell people prices that are based on actually seeing trades happen. And there are a lot of price advisory uh, services in developing countries. There there's uh, several in Uganda. They always kind of come and go with time, um, but almost without exception, as far as I'm aware, they're, they're not based on actually watching markets operate. They're instead based on surveying people. So you kind of go you know, ask a bunch of traders, how much are you paying for maize? Uh, and of course, the problem with that is the traders know how this information is going to get used. And so they um, don't necessarily tell you the right number. They, they might tell you they're paying a little bit less for maize than they really are, because they know that, that that'll come back to lower prices for them. And that there's no particular reason for them not to. Um, so, so these uh, these price alerts um, are, are kind of a big deal, as it turns out. And when we actually went out to villages to meet farmers, um, many of them thought Kudu was a price alert system. That, that's actually what they thought the, the word Kudu even meant. Um, so, oh well. Let's see if I can change the slide. Okay. Uh, so here's a, a picture of uh, our, our recent traction showing a, a, a cumulative density function of the number of users we have uh, on Kudu. Um, versus um, the date. So back in 2012 is when we first launched our pilot um, after my sabbatical in Uganda in uh, 2010. And you know, we eventually built this system out and got it actually working and advertised it a little bit. Um, and I guess just in the beginning of 2013, maybe we started to have some users. Uh, and we did this initial pilot. And we got kind of a few thousand people to use the system. We were pretty happy with it. And then you know we didn't have any more funding, and we sort of moved on to other things. The system kept running, and oddly enough, in the logs, like now and again, somebody would trade some crops on it, but but it wasn't uh, really working at any scale. Um, and then, kind of in mid 2015, we we decided to get serious about it again, and we we were approached by Craig and Lauren, who were going to do a big um, development economics study of uh, agricultural trade in Uganda, and they. They wanted some kind of platform that they could um, use to run uh, electronic trading um, alongside a, a big study they were going to do anyway about certain interventions that had to do with um, you know, guaranteeing um, that, that a trade would really go through or um, different kinds of marketing and you know, various sorts of uh, uh, treatment um, control kinds of uh, experiments. Um, and so we used this as an opportunity to reboot Kudu and to, uh, to get a much bigger team going. Uh, and you can see we've, uh, uh, in, in the last um, year and a half or so, had um, really enormous growth. So now we've, uh, we've broken uh, 20,000 uh, users um, who, who've ever used the system. Um, 
you can see that this graph is sort of spiky. It goes up and then it plateaus and it goes up. Um, that's because there are two growing seasons a year in Uganda, uh, given that it's equatorial. Um, and, uh, and, and that means there, there are periods when a lot of agricultural trading happens and there are periods when you know, no one's harvesting anything and there's, there's less going on. So, so that's why you see these sort of ramp ups and then uh, flat parts. And you know, one of the growing seasons is bigger than the other every year. Uh, but, but you can see things are, are getting um, bigger. Um, another thing that's really great about um, Craig and Lauren's study is that um, they have uh, the ability, uh, frankly, the, the know-how to actually interview um, traders and farmers and find out whether trades that were um, posted on the system and, and that were brokered by the call center in fact happened. So they, they will literally phone people up and confirm that, that something that looked like it was going to be a trade actually happened, that you know, the guy with the truck showed up and picked up the 10 tons of maize. Um, and so here's a picture of all of the verified trades that we know about. So uh, this doesn't mean that uh, absolutely no other trading happened on the system because uh, they, we may have failed to verify all of the trades, uh, but these are, these are trades that we know for sure did happen. Um, and that's why it's a zero before 2016. It doesn't mean that actually nothing happened uh, on the system before then, but it means that uh, we didn't actually know about any trading on the system because we didn't verify it. So um, what you can see here is that we have, um, we, we've done, um, you know, get, getting close to $2 million US in um, cumulative value of trades on the system so far. Uh, so, you know, it's a real money market. People are really exchanging, um, you know, crops for money on, on our platform. Um, overall, maize is uh, responsible for a, a pretty big fraction of the trades on our system, um, which makes sense. It's uh, one of the most traded commodities in Uganda. And then we have a bunch of less um, less important crops, but together they still add up to a pretty significant amount. And they've um, they, they've been growing uh, more slowly than than maize has, or you know we've we've seen that growth more recently. And I think that's uh, that that's again a story about market thickness. You know, if you're the only yellow bean trader on uh, kudu, then kudu is not very useful to you. So you need to kind of wait until we managed to attract enough people who are interested in trading that commodity before the market is useful. And you can see, you know, sort of uh, this past summer, we, we sort of hit the point where many of these other commodities were, uh, were useful to trade. Again, I should, I should ask whether uh, anyone has any questions because I suspect you might be too polite uh, to interrupt me. Uh, does anyone want to uh, ask anything? Perhaps not. Okay. You, you, you can hear me though, right? I sure hope so. Yes. Do you have a question? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm, I'm wondering, wait, can you go one slide back? Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering why there does not seem to be any trades going on between March and July. Um, uh, there are trades going on between March and July. Um, uh, you, you're talking about March and July um, 2017. Uh, yeah. And if you look at the blue line, that's trading maze. Um, so you can see there that there is quite a lot of trading happening. Um, but, but again, you see the effect of, of different seasons. So you can see that there's a, a sort of flat period between sort of May and uh, August when um, you know, farmers are growing things rather than trading. So, so there's a period of less activity. Um, you know, some people kind of stockpile crops and sell them in the off season. So that's why we don't have uh, absolutely no trade happening. But, but there are sort of certain periods of time when, when everyone has just harvested crops and and um, you know, if you're a farmer who uh, you know, lives on a couple dollars a day, you don't necessarily have the financial wherewithal to hold onto your crops for months at a time. So um, this is why people tend to sell all of them in time. And often people have taken out loans to buy their seeds so they can you know, even have something to sell and, and they need to pay those loans so they need to sell their crops as, as quickly. Thank you. Okay, so here's a, a picture of, uh, of trades that have happened on our system. Um, so uh, it's a, a bit of a messy plot to see, but what, what I want you to, so this is a, a picture of a, a sort of slightly zoomed in map of Uganda. You're seeing sort of 80% of the, the land area of Uganda in this picture. Of course, all of you know what the, the ma zoomed in map of Uganda looks like, so you don't need me to tell you that. Um, and what you can what you can see here is um, an edge between two points every time a trade happened that connected those points, um, and the edge is colored by um, by, by the crop that was traded. Um, so 
you know, unsurprisingly, you can see a lot of maize getting traded. We knew that already. Um, you can see that uh, most of the soya trading, um, both buyers and sellers, were in the north. You know, you can see there's some locality to to where some of the trades happen. Um, and uh, uh, the opacity of the edge is showing um, the, the volume of trade that was carried on that edge, which isn't very visible in this figure, but that, that's why the colors are a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, what I want you to take from this figure uh, is it may be um, best kind of conveyed by this um, CDF that I'm going to overlay here. Uh, what I want you to take from this is that there's a lot of short trading, but, but really long distance trading does happen too. Um, and this really reflects the fact that, you know, notwithstanding what I said before about the quality of the road network, kind of trunk roads are, are not terrible. Um, they're, they're not fantastic, but, but they're not terrible. Uh, they're, they're sort of at the grade of like secondary roads in the United States, like, you know, the, the road from, uh, you know, Ithaca to Syracuse kind of grade roads, like not a highway. Um, but uh, so, so you can kind of get around and long distances if you want to, and you know, it turns out to be worth it to people. Uh, and, and particularly these long distance trades are ones that um, our system matching people really makes a difference because somebody who's traveling this kind of distance, uh, hundreds of kilometers, uh, is really likely finding somebody that they, they didn't know about before. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the CDF, what you can see is that it, it sort of breaks up into thirds. So uh, about a third of the, the trades are um, within the same parish, which is the, the lowest level of, uh, of geographic resolution that we have, sort of like a county. Um, and so they don't even show up in this picture because um, the, the start point and the end point uh, are the same point uh, in our graph. So about a third of our trades just don't even show up in the graph. And then about another third are uh, really uh, short distances. So they're sort of like 10, 20 kilometers. Um, so these are these little jagged lines, but then there's a really long tail of people traveling hundreds of kilometers uh, all across the country. Uh, and some of those longer trades are, are the higher volume trades. Sorry, somebody uh, was, was saying something? Perhaps not. Okay. Okay, so um, challenges that the system faces. Um, one really significant challenge is um, usability. So, um, uh, you know, th this is a training session that, that we attended um, where we saw um, how the, uh, th these uh, people who, uh, you know, do community outreach for the company actually go out into villages and train a bunch of farmers. So these are, you know, real farmers who were told like, hey, come into the village square and, you know, sit on these benches and, you know, we're going to tell you about kudu. You can see the, uh, the one guy pointing at the t-shirt that the other guy's wearing and explaining how you can, you know, send a short code to, to send a, a free text message to start initiating communication with the system. Um, we pay for the text messages, obviously. Um, and on the left, you can see a screenshot of the, the live system. So, you know, this person has sent a text message and they've gotten this response back that says, um, welcome to Kudu, please select your language. You can say English, Luganda, Luau, or a fourth language that I can't pronounce the name of. Um, and uh, this is how you interact with the system. So, you know, you sort of navigate this menu. Uh, Technically speaking, what's going on here is actually not SMS. It's something called USSD, um, which sort of lets you navigate a tree of options um, by pressing numbers. Um, so that's that's how you would place a bid or an ask in the system. And so, so you know, a, a challenging thing is that people are not used to doing this in Uganda. You know, e-commerce is not a, a, a big, um, you know, has not really penetrated Uganda at this point. You know, Amazon drones will not come and deliver you a book uh, in a in a village somewhere. So People just have to get used to the idea that you can actually do something on your phone and a person will in fact come and buy your corn. This is just not a, not a familiar concept. Uh, you know, mobile phones have penetrated, people actually talk on mobile phones, they, they get text messages about various things, but, but actual kind of commerce with real people uh, over uh, mobile platforms has not yet taken off. So, so it, it takes a bit of convincing for people to believe that this, this would really be a thing. Uh, here's a picture of uh, the manual matching interface um, with the, uh, the, the buyer names blurred out uh, because these are in fact uh, bids and asks by actual people in Uganda, um, but, but everything else uh, is real. And, uh, and what you can see here is just um, you know, what a mess is to do manual matching, right? So, so you can filter this by um, you know, the county that people are in or the language they speak, or you can sort by price and so on. But you know, eventually you have to look at all of these actual bids and asks and try to figure out, you know, what, what would possibly make sense to go with what. Um, and, um, you know, the, the people in the call center, 
you know, prefer to work in this kind of way because this is what they're used to doing. Um, but but obviously this is not going to scale to to a much larger size. Um, so you know clearly um, something needs to uh, to give. So so what we eventually want, uh, and and you know what, of course we've implemented and to some extent we use is an automatic matching approach that scores potential trades. Uh, so it, it kind of builds a bipartite graph of um, all of the buyers and sellers that it knows about in the system that, that are wanting to trade in the same commodity. Um, it models the sellers as being non-strategic. So if a seller says, I'm willing to sell, you know, one kilogram of maize for, um, you know, 1,700 uh, Ugandan shillings, we say, okay, that's real. That's, that's in fact what the buyer would want to be paid, the uh, seller would want to be paid. And then we use a Vickery Club Groves pricing for, for the buyers. Um, in order to incentivize the buyers to truthfully report their um, their, their, their real willingness to pay. Um, we deliberately set up the market to uh, provide stronger incentives uh, to buyers than to sellers because the sellers are much more desperate in this system than the buyers are. The buyers are more mobile, they have better access to price information, and they're uh, just kind of, they have more outside options. Uh, whereas the farmers are often just really wanting to find some kind of way that they can trade in the system. Or you know, they want somebody to come and buy their corn, they're really desperate to repay a loan, uh, and they're, they're at much kind of greater risk of abuse in their outside options. So, um, so we wanted to make the situation as appealing for buyers as possible, because that will attract buyers to the system, which in turn will um, make, make more farmers want to use the system because they just want kind of anything they can find. Um, so, so we would look at this by matching, and then we, we'd find a maximum weighted matching, um, such as the one shown here, where we say, you know, Sam should match to IO, and uh, Otana should match to Ardiac, and, and so on. So, so the, you know, this, this is, would maximize the, uh, the total gains from trading the system. Um, it's, it's challenging. We, we don't want to do this just based on prices, because not, price is not the only thing that matters. So, so here are some pictures of actual roads in Uganda. Um, the one on the left is what a major road looks like. So this is what connects two major cities. Um, and the one on the right is a fairly good quality um, sort of main road that goes out into the villages. But you can see if you're driving a 13 ton truck, um, you know, overflowing with bags of milled maize here, um, you know, you're not gonna make more than sort of 10 or 20 kilometers an hour driving along this road. So. Um, you know, you're going to care which kind of road it is that, that you're being asked to travel on. And if it's the one on the right and you want to go, you know, 100 kilometers, you know, that, that might just be a non-starter for you. So something we've really grappled with is trying to build an accurate enough sense of how terrible it would be to travel different routes and then to weight the prices accordingly. So to, to have some model of the value of people's time or the fuel costs and, and to um, weight trades appropriately. Um, Various other kinds of questions that we've grappled with and, and think that we still need to think more about um, are um, how often the market should clear. So we don't necessarily want the market to propose, uh, every time you put a bid in, to immediately say, here's an ask that's good for you. We think you two should match up. Um, the reason is market thickness. We want the market to have enough opportunities to trade that uh, you know, we sort of let build, bids and asks build up for a little while, and then we sort of find a bunch of good matchings together rather than um, sort of picking off a, a good trade every time one thing comes in. Um, but on the other hand, if we w ask people to wait too long, then they might just go off and do their outside options. So, so we, we need to kind of think about how to get that right. Um, something we've thought a lot about and, and continue to really grapple with is aggregating supply. So um, often uh, traders want to fill up their truck. So a truck um, will hold sort of 10 or 13 tons of uh, whatever. And the uh, Farmers don't necessarily uh, individually have that much. They tend to sell amounts that are kind of in the tons, but they might sell a couple of tons. And so, you know, if you're asking a trader to drive hundreds of kilometers away to go pick up a couple of tons of something, um, unless they can fill up the rest of their truck, that, that's a, a pretty uh, worthless tra transaction for them. So um, something we would like to do is, is to sort of automatically in the matching figure out you know, this buyer who wants 13 tons should match with like these three or four sellers who are kind of close enough together that they, uh, you know, you could sort of chain them together and, and make that whole trade work. Um, and maybe you could, you could even make that more appealing by saying all of these farmers should, you know, be asked to come to some central location, you know, that's maybe 10 kilometers away from them 
so that the the trader doesn't have to do a milk run, you know, in this rural area, but then they can instead come to a village center, or like a, a you know, somewhere by the side of the main highway or something, and you pick up everything. Um, obviously, this this means that there would be sort of an embedded traveling salesman problem in the matching to think about you know which routings uh, are, are worth looping together, um, and and there's also um, problems with reliability. You know, if, if somebody doesn't show up, then maybe the rest of this bundled trade becomes less appealing. So there's a lot to think about there, but I think ultimately this is something we're gonna to need to do. Another thing we've thought a lot about uh, that I, I kind of um, hinted at already, uh, speaking about the, the roads and geography, is trying to get a good model of utility functions. So um, you know, how should I think about how appealing some counterparty is to somebody trading on the system? Now, how much do they care about the bid being stale? How much does that tell me that, that this trade might not really happen? How much should they care about um, evidence that their counterparty has traded successfully on the system before? Um, how much do they care about traveling long distance? Uh, how much do they care about getting a different quantity than the quantity they said they wanted? And how much do they care about making multiple stops? Um, building a good model of this sort of utility is um, ultimately uh, kind of a machine learning problem. So we, we do have um, some data about trades that have happened in the system before, and we can start to figure out um, which of these factors might have been important to people. Um, but it's pretty tricky because there are different types of bidders in the system. So some are willing to travel long distances and some are not. Some really want to fill up their truck and some don't. So we sort of have this conflated problem of modeling bidder type and figuring out what each type cares about. Um, nevertheless, something that we're thinking actively about. Uh, and putting all of this together, we sort of want to figure out um, what is the probability that a match will actually go through. Um, and, and if we can figure that out, then um, you know, that, that gives us a good, uh, a, a good ability to think about which matches to propose. Because a match where there's a, a big gain from trade, but probably by the time we actually make contact with this person, they just will have sold their stuff to somebody else. Um, you know, that, that's a waste of everybody's time. Um, so, so getting a good model of those probabilities is important. Um, and, and once you start thinking about it, I mean, these probabilities are unfortunately often pretty low. Uh, they're, they're, they can be sort of 10% maybe that, that a match that, that looks good on the system, you know, would actually be able to be brought to fruition because of all of these outside options people have and their unfamiliarity with this kind of trading and so on. Um, and once you realize that, that that's the case, you start getting a little pessimistic about global, tra uh, global clearing at all. You know, if I, I saw this, this weighted bipartite matching on the entire country, I decide, you know, this is maximizing social welfare. But on the other hand, if, you know, 20% or 10% of those trades are actually going to happen, what does it matter that I found a, a global maximum? You know, maybe um, this has so little to do with, with the, the optimal problem that I solved that, that the global clearing is almost a distraction. You know, but at the same time, of course, you know, as computer scientists, as economists, we, we care about the idea of global efficiency. You know, we care about solving optimization problems. We want to somehow bring these ideas together. So something we're, we're actively building right now that we're kind of excited about is a kind of hybrid approach that would um, allow the uh, call center employees to still kind of have a, a degree of manual control and work with one person at a time, because that, that really seems to be the model that at the scale the market's at right now is working. But, but they would still take a global perspective and do more automated matching than is happening now. So we're, we're essentially building an interface where um, the uh, call center employee can kind of see all the bids in the system and they can talk to somebody on the phone and try to find something good for them. But we're going to sort all of the bids in the system based on how good a particular matching looks from the perspective of this uh, counterparty. Um, you're taking into account a global match. So we're, we're not going to make it easy for um, Sam to get suggested Tom if Tom would really pr prefer to trade with Agua. Um, so um, in order to show more than one thing, you know, so the first thing on everybody's list should be um, their pairing at the global match. But then we say, let me drop your pairing in the global match. So in this picture, let me drop, Tom, let me imagine that Tom's bid didn't really exist. You know, let me imagine that I, I matched Agua with Tom and then I phoned up Tom and he said, oh yeah, you know, I didn't actually harvest the crop yet or I sold it to somebody else. Uh, and then we don't want to drop Agba out of the system. So, so then we would, we would rematch and we'd say maybe, you know, in that case, the second option for Agba is Adyak. And so that's the guy you should call next. Um, so so you know, in, by solving many of these counterfactual optimization problems, uh, we would build out this interface that, that lets the, the call center employee uh, propose good trades, and then eventually they actually get people on the phone and they find out that a trade is real and, and they tell the system that this has happened. 
uh, in which case that, that edge gets kind of locked in, both of those traders get taken out, and, uh, and then when we move on to the next person, we're looking at a, a, a smaller version of the problem. Um, I'm almost done, but let me say just a little bit about the other challenges that we face. Um, one thing that, that is inherently challenging about um, agricultural trade in the third world is the enforceability of contracts. So um, you know, sometimes a buyer will show up and try to renegotiate after they've gotten there. Sometimes the buyer will not show up. Um, sometimes the seller um, will play hardball with the buyer. So sometimes the buyer will drive their truck, which they've rented and paid the fuel cost out to some remote place. And then the seller will say, well, I'm not going to sell to you after all, unless you pay me more. And all of these things have really happened in our experience. Um, so, you know, so, so it's fine to say, like, uh, I paired the two of you up, here's the price, but there's no way of making that happen, or, or at least um, you know, the model we have now doesn't, doesn't easily make that happen. Um, uh, it's important for us to understand these different buyer types, people who are willing to travel long distances, people who are willing to travel long distances but prefer to trade in a certain area, or people who are inherently local, whose role really is to you know, travel that last 10 or 20 kilometers on the really bad road, aggregate and, and sell on to the distance traders. Um, and now, you might think, you know, why is it hard to identify these types? Why don't you just ask these people what their type is? Um, indeed, that would be the obvious thing to do. It is remarkably hard to get people to answer any questions like this. Um, you know, we certainly have tried, um, but it's really tough. Every question we ask people um, gets answered in a very spotty way. We get really bad data, and sometimes people just don't answer it at all. Um, and so, um, you know, of course, sometimes we can actually get people to tell us things, but, but it's really important that we be able to infer some of this stuff from data. Um, one problem is liquidity. There, there are sometimes people who would really like to buy something, um, but they just don't have the money to pay for it. And, you know, they know they have the time, they have the, the truck, you know, but they don't have the gas for their truck. And if we can lend them a little bit of money so they can go out and buy the crop and drive it into the city and sell it, you know, maybe they can pay us back, you know, a day later. Um, so we've been actually talking to some microfinance companies about maybe partnering, coming up with some kind of loan that would be scoped only to the system uh, for agricultural traders to try to increase liquidity on the platform. Um, another related issue is it can be pretty dangerous for a trader to drive their truck with you know, enough money to, to buy tons and tons of, of uh, maize or, or beans or whatever. Um, in the middle of the night in uh, you know, some rural part of Uganda because banditry is a real problem. Um, so sometimes and that's one reason why traders can be reluctant to go to a place that they're not already familiar with. Um, so we've wondered about um, trying to partner again with um, uh, mobile money companies uh, in Uganda, which are not as prevalent as they are in some other countries like Kenya, but, but they're still uh, starting to make inroads, uh, and build some kind of escrow system where a... Uh, uh, a buyer would basically put the money in escrow so that the seller would know that the buyer uh, was in some sense committed to showing up. Uh, and this, the buyer would um, know that they didn't actually have to transport the money because it would be sent through mobile money. Um, on the other hand, mobile money uh, imposes relatively expensive surcharges. Uh, it's not entirely um, clear that the, these surcharges are worth it to our customers, but we're trying to figure that out. Um, another big issue is language. So. People just don't all speak the same language in Uganda. There are lots of different kind of um, you know, tribal languages, uh, different um, you know, ethnic groups that, that have their own languages, um, really many different languages. Um, and so um, sometimes these uh, long distance traders are just kind of used to, to dealing with this issue and there are a couple of uh, more prevalent languages they can kind of get by in. Uh, but sometimes it really matters to match people who speak the same languages. Uh, and finally, reputation tracking is non-trivial because uh, it's really easy to just appear on the system as a new person. Um, you can buy a new SIM card in Uganda for 50 cents. Um, and so it's not that hard to just reinvent yourself as a new guy if, uh, if it looks like you know, the system is starting to think that you're a bad actor. And so anything we do to track reputations has to deal with the fact that you can whitewash yourself really easily. Um, so you know, in conclusion, um, agricultural markets in Uganda are currently really inefficient. Uh, we're trying to do something about that by bringing an electronic market um, to the, this kind of subsistence agricultural setting, um, both with manual and automatic matching and with price advisory services. Um, the system is, is real, it's running. We have um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars trading every month, but uh, we have plenty of work still to be done. Um, we're moving towards a continuous clearing model 
Uh, and we have all kinds of other questions around market design, usability, geography, trust, and, and on and on. So um, thanks for your attention. Thanks for bearing with me through all of these uh, technical uh, hiccups. And I'm, I'm happy to hear any uh, questions or thoughts you might have. Thanks again. Thank you, Kevin. So are there any questions? We won't uh, stay on too long because um, we've run over, of course, but if there's a one or two quick questions, that would be uh, great. Okay, Kevin, I think uh, you got your questions during the talk itself. Um, I think it will be easy to edit out the uh, initial um, the initial uh, part where we had problems connecting, but um, yeah, that was, uh, that was good. We'll um, perhaps uh, uh, talk more later. Great. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for, uh, for your time, and uh, I look forward to interacting in the future. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye, everybody.